Kentucky sustained the majority of the damage. Uh, there was damage right across the Midwest. Cities across nine states, including Missouri, were hit particularly hard as well. ABC News senior meteorologist Rob Marciano is on the ground in St. Louis uh, with the latest. Thanks for joining us, Rob. You got it, so, Terry. Uh, you're right about that. It's a. Uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I did. Yeah, fire away. I mean, you're you're there on the ground. You know what happened here. You know, four tornadoes recorded in that area. Uh, tell us, from your perspective as our senior meteorologist, what happened and why. Well, we had first of all, we had an unusual amount of heat for the month of December, and uh, we, as we get deeper into winter, the jet stream gets stronger, and that's part of the one of the ingredients that you need. Those upper level winds, you need strength at different levels, you need winds at different directions at different levels, and, and we had that with this unusual warmth. So uh, we saw this coming several days in advance. The issue is you, you just don't know if a town or several towns in this case is going to be hit. And uh, we had a, the unfortunate event of a long track tornado, destructive tornado on the ground for potentially over 200 miles. But that, as you mentioned, that's not the only one. We had several pop here in and around the St. Louis area, and those were EF2s, EF3 tornadoes, one of which skipped the river and went over into Illinois and hit that Amazon uh, packaging facility. And unfortunately, six fatalities there, uh, a horrific night for sure, but we're just, we're just part of the puzzle. This, you know, it's been 10 years since we've seen an outbreak like this, and I don't know how long since we've seen an outbreak like this across several states. So it's really difficult to cover, quite frankly, as a reporter and then an all-encompassing meteorologist, where did all these tornadoes uh, occur? Which ones are the same tornadoes, or at least with the same tornadic cell? And how far and how wide and how how strong were they? And we're just now starting to get our arms around that, uh, you know, several days later. And Rob, you know, we have to talk about the impact of climate change. And I was just speaking with Terry, you know, a little bit ago about, you know, when it comes to these mild temperatures, you know, you walk outside in December, you think, oh, it feels nice. But that's also just the recipe for what can really be a dangerous situation for what we're seeing there in the Midwest, which is, I mean, you're the meteorologist, you're the scientist here. But when it comes to the heat and climate and whatnot, we're kind of curious about what role climate change plays on what we've just seen there over the weekend with that deadly tornadic um, situation there. Well, you're right, Kenneth. You know, when something bad like this happens, we want answers. We want to be able to point to something. And, uh, you know, the, the last few years, we've been able to link some of those extreme weather events, at least partially, to climate change. Drought, sure. Heat waves, of course. Um, hurricanes, to some extent. Floods, absolutely to, to some extent as far as uh, the amount of rain that comes in a short period of time. Convective storms, supercell thunderstorms, ones that produce tornadoes, the evidence is really unclear, very low confidence. Matter of fact, scientists are still throwing their hands up in the air saying we don't really have any evidence that suggests that climate change makes uh, thunderstorms worse that, that would produce tornadoes and make them stronger or more frequent. That said, one of the ingredients, as you alluded to, is, is heat, and that's what we had in the month of December. Unusual amounts of heat, record-breaking uh, warm temperatures on that Thursday and Friday. So it basically set the atmosphere up like it was November, a month where we typically get uh, uh, tornadic thunderstorms, or even March, another month that is very active. So December acted like one of those months, and uh, it, what is typically, at least here in the Mid-South, a quiet, the quietest month of the year as far as tornadoes go. Typically, if they're going to happen, they're going to happen a little bit farther to the south. It happened this far north. And I think there, when and where these things happen, we can, we can have a bit of a link to climate change. And so we might see these things, much like fire seasons, and the season expand both timing-wise and geographically. Hmm. And, and, Rob, you mentioned uh, the Amazon warehouse in, in Edwardsville, Illinois. I guess six Amazon workers killed. So uh, what else can you tell us uh, about the search and rescue operations there? What happened there? Well, so this, this is a facility, a brand new facility. It's just, just over a year old, so it's well built. These are concrete walls, nearly a foot thick, reinforced with steel, three, four stories high. The roof was, the, the roof was torn up, winds uh, uh, 150 miles an hour, uh, tearing down those, those concrete walls. And this was happening 7, 8 o'clock at night 
right around when the delivery drivers are coming back after finishing their routes and basically turning their keys into their bosses and, and going home. So not a good time for this to happen and probably cause a little bit more chaos than it should have when the alarms went off inside the building saying there was a tornado warning. There are safe, there are shelter in place rooms. I shouldn't say safe rooms, but shelter in place rooms, not necessarily tornado proof that are, are in that building and employees know they have to get there when those alarms go off. Um, there were over 40, maybe 45 employees that were working there at the time that survived. Um, so that's the good news. Sadly, uh, there were six, six people, about half of them at least were drivers that did not. And the Amazon uh, community is certainly in mourning. I've been speaking with them for the past couple of days. Boy, we spoke with uh, one daughter of, a, of her, her father who uh, passed away. He was he was a truck uh, driver, delivery driver, and boy, just absolutely heartbreaking. The pain is real here, um, and uh, they're in shock. They're in mourning. They've been the, the people that work in that facility. They've been given the week off, and just and and they're just going to regroup and try to pick up the pieces. It is very, obviously a very busy time for them, so they want to get back to work in some capacity. But it's not safe. The, re, the the search has ended. To answer your question, now mm. they're basically demolishing parts of that facility. Got the heavy equipment in there, and they're going to start to at least clean things up and try to get back to work in uh, some capacity. But you know, as confusing as things have been in Kentucky, things have been a little bit more concrete here in Illinois mm. and Missouri, and that. We're done with the search and rescue. Everybody's accounted for, for better or for worse, and we can at least start to, to move forward. Got it. And, Rob, if I could just quickly follow up on, on that building. It's a new building, you said, well-built. You know, just the pictures that, that took me by surprise because just looking at the pictures, you know, it looks like a toy that got knocked over uh, on the floor. So the forces that we're talking about there, you said 155-mile-an-hour winds. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm curious, is, is it moving slowly or does it go off like a bomb? I mean, how does... It seems like a building can withstand some buildings. You know, you've been in plenty of hurricanes with high winds, yeah. although that's very high indeed. I'm just wondering about the process of destruction, the speed with which it moved, and, and how, those, how a tornado does tear something apart like that. Well, if you think about, think about a garage door, you know, and, and you only need one weak spot in a house and the garage door is always a weak spot and if once that garage door goes that will allow that wind and all that force to get up underneath a structure so in in this sort of case where you've got you've got a facility that's acres large um you know that's not the the most well-built roof the walls are but once that roof goes then all that wind can get inside and start to hit it from inside and out. And that's the way it's been described to me by these engineers that um, know a lot more than I do. Uh, and when they go out and analyze these, these storms and figure out how strong they are, that's what they're doing. They're using engineering techniques to think, to look at how a, how a structure was built and how it withstood or didn't withstand um, that, that force. And, because that structure is well built, they knew it was not just an EF3, but a uh, moderate to strong EF3 tornado. Because as you alluded to, it's, it's just tough, tough to get your mind around and look at that and go, how, my goodness, the force it must have taken to take apart that uh, modern building. And uh, Mother Nature has that kind of force, Terry. Mm. And Rob, you've seen Mother Nature do all types of work. I'm curious before you leave us, uh, from your years of experience being in the storm zones and storm zones across this country, your thoughts on what you saw out of Kentucky with a 200, path, 200 mile path of destruction. I mean, that, when you hear some of the numbers coming out of there, I mean, it was just jaw dropping for, for us everyday folk. So for you as a meteorologist and for what you've seen, how would you describe that amount of destruction? Well, uh, first, going back to the science and tracking this the night it happened, seeing that signature on radar and, and knowing that this thing could very well be on the ground for that long across four states. I mean, the last time we had a tornado that was on the ground this long was back in like 1925. They called that the tri-state tornado because it was three states. We're calling this now the quad-state tornado because it's four states. And once they get all these storm surveys done, we'll see. So far, they know it's, it was on the ground at least in the middle part of it, over 128 miles uh, so far. And they're going to continue surveying to see if we go over the 225-mile mark, which would be the longest in, in U.S. history. For that to happen in December, is, is shocking to me as, as a meteorologist and then as a human to see uh, what this does on the ground. It's, uh, you think you would get numb to it, uh, covering this, but you don't. And then certainly when you talk to the, to the survivors and, and the, the survivors of the victims um, who passed away, it just, you know, that's, that's humanity 
right there and it, and it crushes your soul. It's, it's, it's tough to, whether you're a hardcore journalist or not, you're, you're impacted by the pain that the people here are dealing with. And especially this time of year, obviously heading into the holidays, guys, it's tough. Yeah. Mm. No matter the state, as we just heard from a woman and, you know, spoke with Ellen Lopez, she said, we're all just people there. And uh, Rob, we always appreciate you there, and especially um, before and even more so in the aftermath, because you're right there talking to those people who are just trying to get through it, who are survivors as well. So thank you again, Rob Marciano. We appreciate it. Thanks, Rob. You bet, guys. Good to be with you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos, show highlights, and watch live event coverage, click on the right over here to subscribe to our channel. And don't forget to download the ABC News app for breaking news alerts. Thanks for watching.